Hi everyone, please say welcome to Andreas. So, good morning everyone. Um, I'm Andreas and today I'm going to talk about uh, analyzing data with Docker. And before I start, I want to thank again uh, the organizers for inviting me to the conference. It's really great to see a lot of people here for the second or third time and I'm really excited to speak to you today about this. Um, so my own background, uh, to say that, is uh, in science. I've been uh, um, working in physics, and I've been using Python since about 2009 for my own work. And in the last five years, I've been mostly working on data science problem, also, uh, of course, using uh, Python as my main tool of choice. So um, we're going to attack this problem as follows. Um, first, I'm going to give you um, small introduction to um, data analysis and explain the different scales and the different types of analysis that we can do and why sometimes um, that might be difficult. Um, afterwards, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about Docker so that we all understand what it is and how we can possibly use it. And then I want to give you some examples of how we can containerize our data analysis using this technology. Um, finally, I want to talk about some other possible approaches. I want to um, show you some relevant technologies um, that you can use, and I want to give you some outlook uh, into the future of uh, containerized data analysis. Okay, oh, whoops. So let's get started. Um, data analysis is a pretty large field. So um, as a data analysis, I analyst, I like graphs. So here you have a graph about uh, uh, the different scales and the different types of uh, um, analyzing data. So I try to segment this a bit from uh, small scale to large scale, and from interactive to automated methods. And if you look, for example, in the upper left quadrant here, you would have um, automated small scale data analysis tasks. So this would be um, typically some scripts or uh, Python code that uh, interacts with um, your data, for example, a local database, and does some analysis on that on a non-interactive way. On the lower left quadrant here, you have uh, things that are interactive and possibly user interface based. So um, a good example for this would be the IPython notebook, where you can analyze your data in an interactive and straightforward way. And you can do so um, very easily using graphical uh, methods and using various types of data sources as well. Um, if you go to the large scale data analysis, we have um, things like uh, uh, Apache Hadoop, which is uh, mostly non-interactive technology that allows us to perform data analysis tasks at very, very large scales in a batch uh, way. On the lower, and lower right quadrant, on the other hand, you have um, tools which are also um, helping us to deal with very large data sets, but which are more interactive than traditional, for example, map-reduced-based reduce, approaches. Um, examples for this would be, for example, Apache Spark or Google BigQuery. So what kind of uh, um, tools am I going to talk about today? Um, everything, of course. So, <laughs> And um, I want to show you that using containers can help us uh, in all of these areas. So if we have lots of tools for data analysis, you may, you may ask yourself, what is actually so difficult about this? Well, in my own experience, and maybe from your experience, several things. First, oh, oh. <laughs> Sharing and uh, sharing your data and tools is not exactly easy. Um, as a scientist, I experienced this myself. Um, my PhD, um, I started that in 2009, and uh, I used uh, uh, Python for a lot of things. And back then, my analysis workflow would basically involve a few hacked together uh, scripts in Python and some um, data files that I would keep in directories. So um, sharing those. Um, files, the data, and the tools that I used um, was possible, of course, but it was not easy and it was not uh, surely straightforward to give other people access to this kind of things. Um, this leads, of course, to problems in uh, reproducing results here. So here we see uh, a cell in the process of reproducing, and it can do that because it has all the necessary information uh, that it needs for it available to it. And if you try to reproduce our results in science or in other contexts, um, it's not that easy because often we're lacking um, like the context and several critical parts of the data analysis process. And another thing that is difficult in data analysis is the scaling. You know that uh, probably um, at a small scale, 
you have a, um, a lot of tools available that you can use to analyze your data. Um, I mentioned IPython and the IPython notebook earlier. And there are a lot of different ways to handle, for example, the plotting and uh, um, the processing of data at this scale. But if you go to larger scales, um, you normally need um, a totally different set of tools. So um, the normal tool set that you use for your small data sets doesn't apply anymore to this world. You need technologies like MapReduce, like Hadoop, and you, that means you need to rewrite a lot of your data analysis tools um, because uh, when you're getting bigger. And so how can Docker help us um, to overcome some of these problems? Well, let's first try to understand what Docker is actually about. So Docker um, is basically a tool that helps us to deploy applications inside of software containers. And if I say software containers, you're probably thinking of virtual machines, um, but it's not the right approach because Docker uh, containers are working on a process level and they isolate um, different aspects of the operating systems, for example, processes, uh, resources, and um, the files that an application sees. This means that some aspects, for example, the kernel that your containers are running on, are shared between them. And this is exactly what makes Docker very interesting because it uh, provides a more lightweight way to uh, isolate applications from each other. And Docker, so this is the basic idea, and of course, um, we need a lot of uh, tooling um, to make this uh, idea convenient. So Docker provides a high-level API that helps you to manage, version control, deploy, and network your containers. So if you look at the core concepts of Docker, at the basis we have uh, the image, which um, you can imagine as a um, frozen version of a given system that contains the whole file system that we need to launch a given container. And as you can see here, images um, are versioned, and um, some images are based on other images. And um, we have also images that are uh, not based on anything else, which we call a base image. And we will see later why um, version controlling images and uh, building them on top of each other is a great idea. So you can keep your images on your local computer, of course, but um, what makes it convenient to use them is to uh, put them into a registry. So Docker has uh, its own registry on Docker Hub, but it's also possible to run your own private registry server. Now, um, a container, in this sense, is nothing but a running instance of an image. So each of these containers here has a given image associated with it, and um, philosophically, or like conceptually, uh, containers are ephemeral, that means that the state of a given container is not saved when um, it stops working. So that means that in order for containers to be useful, to do any data processing, we usually uh, want to attach some resources to a container. And this is shown here. So um, containers can run on any number of hosts, and each host that the containers runs on um, run, uh, runs the so-called Docker engine, which is responsible for managing um, starting, stopping, and uh, uh, monitoring the containers in a given host. Now, one of the very great things about Docker, what I like a lot, is the ability um, to network containers together, which is a quite uh, recent feature and which basically abstracts away um, the networking of different hosts. So we can completely ignore the physical constraints of our network and can uh, construct virtual networks that connect uh, different containers to each other which, of course, is very useful if we have um, applications that rely on multiple containers and multiple services that need to talk to each other over the network. Um, to orchestrate all that, um, there are a couple of tools. For example, there's Docker Swarm, which uh, makes it easy to deploy um, Docker containers on a cluster of machines. And there are also, um, if you ask yourself, how do you uh, manage all this, um, it's through the Docker API, which provides a REST interface um, that allows you to um, create containers, manage them, uh, monitor them, and uh, um, do everything that is possible in the Docker ecosystem. Um, the command line interface, which uh, we, you will mostly use to interact with uh, Docker on uh, your machine, is nothing else but a client to this Docker API. Good. So what do I like about Docker? Well, one thing that I really think is very is great uh, is that um, images are space efficient. 
And they are space efficient because they're based on a so-called um, layered file system, which you can imagine um, somehow like an onion, where you have different layers, and you can just add layers on top of an existing layer. And here I have an example of the image that we're going to use later in our data analysis. Um, you can see in the beginning when we created this image, we downloaded a lot of data, about 124 megabytes, which corresponds to the Ubuntu base image that we used. And then we did some things. So we installed um, some, we did some uh, shell scripting, we installed some uh, things, and we called, for example, apt-get update to get the newest repositories, which added about 38 megabytes to our image size. Then we installed Python 3 on the image, and then afterwards we installed our analysis script. And you can see um, the last steps here, where we analyze, where we add the script, uh, um, consume only very little space, in this case, a few kilobytes. And this is really great because it means if you make small changes to your containers, the um, size of, uh, uh, sorry, to your images, the size of your images on a disk will not grow linearly with the number of those images. That means you can build a lot of different versions of your software without worrying about filling up your disk with all different images files. Another thing which is really great um, is that containers have very little overhead. And what I mean with this, you can see here. So that's um, two graphs that I, put, that I took from a paper from IBM uh, from late 2014, um, where they, the two authors compared the uh, performance of uh, um, the virtual, uh, the native uh, Linux uh, with various virtualization technologies like Docker and, in this case, KVM. And uh, we're seeing two things. Here's one thing, the write latency of um, disk operations. So this is the cumulative distribution function where we want to be on the left side if we want to be fast. And the other thing that we're seeing is the, are the input-output operations per second for different use cases. And you can see that Docker here imposes actually very little or almost no overhead compared to the native solution, whereas another virtualization technology, KVM, um, you can see that there's a significant uh, performance drop here. And I mean, I don't want to make any of these virtualization technologies bad because they're doing uh, something that is very different from Docker. You know, they're providing things that are impossible to do with Docker. But you can also see that by doing this, um, they're, and they're incurring a, pen a performance penalty. And with Docker, we don't have that. So we can um, operate our applications at the, um, the same speed um, like if we would run them on a native system. Another thing which is great, of course, is that containers are self-sufficient. And this means that um, as soon as we have an image that we can run with Docker, um, we have everything that we need to run our application. So we don't need to install any dependencies on the host system, except Docker, of course. And we can rely on the fact that the application bundles everything that it needs inside the containers or inside, another, um, or inside a set of containers, so to say. And this makes things like sharing um, tools for data analysis or sharing data itself much easier than relying on a workflow where we would need um, our users to install um, a lot of different dependencies on their system, which might be problematic because uh, versions change, uh, systems change, and it's always difficult to manage all these uh, different dependencies. And if we can bundle them into an image and run it as a container, then all of these problems disappear. So in that sense, um, containers can be seen as uh, Lego blocks for data analysis. Um, or if you want to um, regard that more in a functional context, you could uh, see them as a um, unit of computation where you have certain inputs, for example, configuration data, um, your data files, and possibly other network containers. You perform some computation on that, and you produce an output. And this is a very um, powerful idea because it allows us to um, construct data analysis workflows um, that are reproducible and can easily scale to large systems. So here, for example, uh, we would have a use case where we would take um, log files from different sources, for example, Apache logs, uh, Nginx logs, and use two containers to um, uh, map uh, out the interesting information in those logs, then um, use another container to aggregate those results, um, use a container finally to filter those results for things that are interesting to us and pass that on to other containers that, for example, uh, put that information into a business intelligence system, into a monitoring system, or into an archive. Okay, um, so now we talked a lot about uh, the theory. Now I want to show you um, some very simple example on how to do this actually in practice. And 
the thing that we're going to look at is a log file analysis. So we're going to download some data from the GitHub archive, and we're going to process them um, and extract some interesting information. And then we're going to uh, perform a reduce step to um, get the summary of that information over all the log files that we're interested in. And the code um, of this is available on GitHub if you're interested. And as you can see, the, um, the basic workflow is very simple. We have our analysis script uh, that um, takes some log files from GitHub, launches an analysis process, and then produces some output. OK, and now please keep your fingers crossed, because we're going to do a live demo. Good. So you can see we have several files in this directory here. If you look at the um, analyze file, you can see that we're importing a bunch of standard libraries here. Um, we're defining our data directory. So I can show you that the data directory actually contains a bunch of JSON, Gunstead JSON files that we're going to analyze. And um, I mean, the first question that you probably have now is, uh, who is uh, pushing commits to GitHub on uh, the 1st of January? Well, obviously, a lot of people. So to analyze those files, um, we have several functions here in our script. Um, we have just one function that lists all the files in the directory. Um, if they contain uh, a json.gz ending, then we have um, the analyze, function, uh, analyze file function, which takes a file name, um, initializes a dictionary of uh, word frequencies, then opens the file um, using gunzip, when it goes through each line of this file, and uh, decodes it using the JSON module, then checks if the data contained in a given line is a push event. And if that's true, um, there's a commits entry in that event that we can use to extract the number of words from the commit messages. So here we just split each word um, for non-alphanumeric characters. And for each of those words that we obtain like this, we increase the count of our word frequencies. Finally, we, reduce, we return that, and that's it. And then we have the reduce function, which takes the result uh, as produced by this analyze file function and uh, just adds the counts in that file in those results together, producing a global dictionary of all the um, different words in the, and their frequency. So, and the main block of our script uh, does nothing else than use this get files function to list all the files in the directory, um, analyze each of these files, um, reduce the results, and then print out um, the statistics. So if we run that, so it will take some time to, to do that, uh, going through each file and uh, calling the analyze and the reduce function at the end. And you can see we got a pretty straightforward result. Uh, and if you ask yourself who is pushing all those commits to GitHub, well, it's uh, apparently JavaScript developers. <laughs> And you can see that the good Python developers, they seem to be uh, taking a day off on New Year's Day. Good. So very um, simple, very straightforward way to analyze this data. Um, so now let's have a look how we can um, take this um, data analysis and containerize it. And to do that, we're going to make some changes to our workflow. So um, instead of having our analysis script work directly with the data, we use it to first create a Docker image. And then we're going to use some supervisor script that's also written in Python to create a um, bunch of containers based on this image that then take each of them a chunk of the data, analyze it, and finally produce an output that we can, again, with the supervisor, reduce and convert into the result that we are interested in. OK. So let's go back to our directory. And let's first have a look at how we create the Docker image. So if you see, here we have a um, so-called Docker file in our directory, which is a um, file that specifies the uh, specifics of, of our image that we want to create. And you can see here that we are um, basing our image on the Ubuntu 16.04 base image. Uh, we're saying that uh, I'm the maintainer of that image. And then we're um, doing a bunch of simple steps. Uh, first, we update the apt cache so we can uh, get an up-to-date version of all the packages available. Then we install the Python tree package in our system. Um, and then finally, we copy the Docker analyze py, which is in the same directory as the Docker file, into the container. 
um, at this location here. And the final line specifies the command that is being run when the container starts up. In this case, it's uh, the Python tree interpreter that runs the file that we just put there. So we can use Docker to build that file. We just call Docker build and then um, tag the resulting image with the name that we want to use. And up, as you can see here, we did nothing basically because the image already existed before. But you can see that um, Docker went through all of the steps, checked if it already has an image that corresponds to the version that we want to have, and then uh, successfully creates a new image with the given name. Now, we could run that image manually using the run command, which is a bit complicated. So let's go through that here. So basically, we're saying docker run. Uh, we're saying that we want to run that with a given user ID and a given process, a group idea. We want to expose all the ports of the Docker container. Um, we then um, specify certain environment variables, which I will explain a bit later. And we just um, say that we want to mount this directory here as the data directory and this directory at the out as the output directory. And finally, we specify the container, uh, the name of the image that we want to run. And so if we do that, we just receive the output of the container that is being run. And as you can see, it already finished. And now, let's have a look at our analysis script, actually. Oops. <laughs> so like before, we have a Python script that uh, operates on a data directory and that produces um, output in an output directory. And we have one function that is called analyze file that takes a file name and does the same um, kind of map operation that we saw before in our traditional analysis script. Um, now we don't have any reduce function, as uh, I will explain later. Uh, and instead, we only have a main block that takes the input file names from the environment variable input file names here and then goes to each one of them, um, calling the analyze uh, file function and uh, writing the result into the output directory that is uh, mounted into the Docker container. So, and as I said, we need an orchestrator or like a, a way to start these containers, of course. And for this, we wrote a simple Python script. Again, we specify our container name, the data directory, the output directory, and the number of containers that we want to launch. So the um, parallelization degree of this problem, if you want. And the first thing that we do here is to use the Docker uh, Python API to create a Docker client to our local Docker engine. And then, um, retrieve the files from the data directory, um, analyze um, each file in the container, and uh, reduce the given output file. So maybe we can step through this a bit more in detail. So the analyze file and container function takes a number of files and then creates a host, so-called host config, which specifies um, the um, different directories that we want, want to mount into the container. In this case, we want to mount the data directory in a read-only way and an output directory in a read-write mode, read -write mode. And this host configuration, we can then pass to the create container function, where we also pass in the container name, um, the user ID that we want to use, um, the host configuration that we just created, and the environment variables, which just contains a list of the files that we have um, given as a parameter to the function. And now the main function looks like this. So we first retrieve all the files that we want to analyze here. We then um, chunk those files up into pieces of like uh, four or five, depending on our uh, parameter n. And then uh, we create for each um, of those uh, chunked file lists a container that is uh, performing the map step for each of these files. Um, we append those containers to a list so that we can use them later. And then we wait that all the containers finish their work of uh, mapping the files. As soon as this is done, we can um, call the reduce output files function, which takes all the files that have been created by the containers in the output directory, reduces them, and then produces the result that we're interested in. So if we run this now, so we have to do that with Python 2, because I have only installed the Docker API for that version, but it also works with Python 3, of course. So we call um, Python 2 docker parallelize. This will um, launch the containers for the individual files. It will wait for the results, and as you can see, it's even a bit faster than before. And in the end, we get exactly the same result as before. And you can see the files that have been created in the output directory by the containers are here. So um, pretty straightforward to actually go from a workflow where we use normal Python 
to a containerized uh, workflow where we, where we also use Python, but based uh, on a Docker uh, con workflow. So um, this was, of course, a very simple example. And uh, I wanted to show you uh, the basics of this approach. And in real life, um, the, um, the complexity would be higher, of course, for any real data analysis application. And there um, are uh, certain advantages and disadvantages associated to this approach. So one advantage is, of course, that it's, as I said, easy to share your um, data analysis workflows, because now when we have an image with our scripts, we can just push that to the Docker Hub, for example, and anybody can download that image and use it locally on his or her machine. Um, each analysis step um, is self-sufficient in a way that the container doesn't care about its environment. As you've seen, we, are, we only specify the input files and the output uh, directory for the container, and everything else was inside the container. So there are no dependencies that we need to run this analysis except from the input and the output data. Um, as I also showed you, the um, containerization makes it pretty easy to parallelize our um, analysis process. And um, I mean, for this example, we ran everything on a single host. But uh, as I said, with Docker Swarm, it's also possible to run this kind of analysis on a multi-cluster um, environment. So we can easily parallelize our workloads to hundreds or even thousands of Docker containers. Um, and the nice thing is also that, of course, with the image-based approach, we have a versioning um, of our data analysis script included for free. Well, disadvantages, there are also a few. Um, it's, of course, a bit more complex because we have to prepare our containers for the analysis. Um, we need to install Docker on each machine that uh, should perform the data analysis, obviously. And uh, we also have lost a bit of interactivity and flexibility in doing our analysis. So um, which parts are actually missing from this workflow? For me, um, three things. First. As we've seen, um, we need a lot of orchestration to make sure that we have um, all the containers running as they should. And uh, for the simple case that I showed here, it was not that important. But for any real-world data analysis, you probably need databases. You need um, maybe task queues. So you have a lot of different things that you need to put together and uh, launch in the right order. And so you need a lot of orchestration capabilities to do this in a straightforward and effective way. Um, another thing is, of course, dependency management, because in most real-world data analysis context, um, you want to not only perform the steps of your data analysis that you really need to perform. So for example, if you have several types of data and uh, uh, they depend on each other in, for example, this way, we do not want to perform all of our data analysis again only if, for example, this part here or this part here changes. We want to perform only those things that are really necessary to redo with the changed data sets. And finally, we also need a way to, to manage the resources. So um, in our example, we produced a lot of output files already. And in real world data analysis, you will produce many more of those files. And it's also important to uh, manage and version control those things for which Docker, unfortunately, does not provide any good uh, means right now. And so I was um, thinking with Docker um, a bit on my own time, and uh, I um, happened on these problems, so I decided to um, start writing a small tool, which is called Rouster, and which is built on the top of the Docker API. And if you would summarize it in one sentence, you could say that it's uh, make for Docker. So um, it provides basically the three uh, functionalities that I talked about before, so resource management, container orchestration, and dependency management. And I have to say it's still an early prototype, but um, I want to show you a bit how it works. So um, the basic uh, um, concept of Rooster is a so-called recipe, which specifies three things. We have uh, first the resources that we want to use in our data analysis. Then we have the services that we need to run, for example, databases, et cetera. And then we have a sequence of actions that we want to perform in order to perform the analysis. And the resources here layer includes things like versioning, dependency calculation of the different resources, uh, backing them up, copying them, and distributing them to the machines where we want to perform, perform the analysis. Um, the services section um, deals with things like uh, starting up the services, uh, including the right order to do that, uh, provisioning the resources to those services, and uh, networking them together. Um, the action section then um, is concerned with scheduling the different actions that we need in our data analysis, um, monitoring them, uh, performing exception handling, and finally doing some logging for us. OK, uh, again, I want to show you a small live demo here. So what we are going to look at 
is, um, again, really a very simple example where we want to convert a CSV file into a, uh, where we want to load a CSV file into a Postgres database. So if you look at the recipe for um, this um, data analysis, mm -hmm, uh, we can see we have a resources section where we specify all the resources that we need for this kind of uh, analysis. So first, of course, we have our CSV file, which um, comes from the user resources, uh, which we want to mount as read-only, and which we should make available, uh, or which has the URL, electricity.csv, in this case. Then we have the Postgres data, which is um, the database where we want to put the data. Um, and here we tell Rooster that it depends, uh, that the, the state of this um, database depends both on the CSV file and on the converter script that we are using to create the database, and that we should create um, the resource, if it doesn't exist, that the URL um, is uh, Postgres, and that it's also a user resource, and that we want to move the, uh, to uh, mount it in write mode. So finally, we have the converter script that uh, performs the conversion between CSV and the Postgres database, and this comes directly from the recipe, and it uh, is contained in the converter URL. So, so far, so much about the resources. The services um, are listed here. In this case, it's only a single service, uh, notably a Postgres database, which uses the Postgres image um, and which exposes uh, this port here to the outside world and which makes use of the Postgres data resource that we have defined up here. And here you can see that we mount this resource at this location where Postgres will be able to find that and to use that to initialize or work with the database. So finally, we have the action sections, which contains, in that case, also only a single entry um, that uses the Python tree image that we created before and uh, executes um, this converter, convert.py uh, script that takes the data from the CSV file and loads it into the database. And this container needs access to both of the, the converter script and the CSV file, obviously. So now if we, we can launch this recipe by just saying rooster uh, run and then recipes CSV to Postgres. And you can see that like several things are happening now. So what Rooster did now is to um, look first look that all the images which we require are available on the system, and then um, initialize the resources, in that case copy or initialize the Postgres data, uh, make sure that the input data is there, and also check that the script which we need is uh, present in the recipe. Um, then mount those resources, um, create the Postgres service, uh, and finally, launch the um, analysis step, so the action uh, phase, and give the action um, access to the Postgres database through a virtual network. And this took a while to run, and you can see the output here of um, both the Postgres container, which created our database, and the Python container, which ran the script that uh, inserted those rows in the database. And you can see that we inserted about 35,000 lines of CSV into the Postgres data. And now the Resulting, the resulting uh, data is put here. And you can see that Rooster also takes care of versioning your data by um, using a um, UID-based approach where we always copy uh, the previous version of the data and providing a link to the parent so that we can go back in time and, uh, uh, for example, revert to a good state of our database in case anything goes wrong in our analysis. All right, um, now this is again a pretty simple case. Um, it also works for more complex problems where we have uh, different services and uh, more action steps that uh, depend on each other. And um, of course, there are still some open questions here. Um, in the example that we, had look at, that we looked at earlier, we used uh, files to communicate the results of our analysis between containers, but there are also different approaches. So we could, uh, for example, use the network or even use the Docker API to communicate that. And right now, there's no canonical way to do this, so to say. Um, also, uh, an open question, especially for distributed systems, is, of course, how to make the data available to the containers. And there, Docker doesn't provide a good solution, and um, we can probably rely on some technologies for, um, 
things like um, uh, MapReduce, so for example, the Hadoop distributed file system, um, but it's also not clear what is the optimal way to do this kind of thing here. Um, of course, there are some other technologies that are interesting in this space. I wanted to just briefly show you two of them here. Um, one of them is uh, Pachyderm, um, which is a um, US-based uh, startup that uh, provides an open source tool um, for um, data analysis using Docker. And the great thing about their solution is that they provide both a version-controlled um, view on top of your data. So they basically have version control for large data sets. And they make it very easy to uh, build a dependency graph-based uh, analysis workflow. And um, I talked yesterday to one of the founders, and uh, it's a really great product. Uh, um, so um, compared to Rooster, it also works uh, reliably already. So if you want to have something that works both at, uh, at a large scale as well, you should definitely check it out. Uh, another thing that I wanted to mention here, which is not directly related to Docker, but which helps you also with uh, managing your dependencies in data analysis, is Luigi, which is a library that um, was built by Spotify and uh, that can um, build, help you to build complex data analysis uh, pipelines where you have a lot of interdependencies between your individual data analysis step, and Luigi kind of uh, figures out how to run your analysis and how to only run those steps of the analysis that are really required. Good. Um, so um, to summarize, containers are um, by now a pretty mature technology, and they are probably here to stay. Um, they are very useful in uh, a variety of data analysis contexts. They don't solve all of our problems with data analysis, though. And um, that means that we need additional tools to um, handle them effectively. Some of them I showed you, and I also showed you how you can use Python in conjunction with Docker to uh, use this kind of approach to data analysis. OK, uh, so with that, I'm at the end. Uh, if you're interested in um, the tool and roster, you can find it here on GitHub. Uh, contributions are highly welcome. And I think we have time for some questions. So thank you. Um, thank you. This is useful, exciting, and um, yeah, I have, I have a question about so running uh, on the class, uh, so running this on the cluster. Uh -huh. How does the Docker Swarm use like so? If you have like a powerful uh, single machine, let's say, uh, or you have several of those machines, but they are powerful, they are multi CPU. Uh, how does it scale? Does it will, will it use all the cores on that uh, powerful machine? Mm -hmm. This approach. Um, so and any other bottlenecks? Okay. I didn't do any uh, performance evaluation of that, but uh, um, Swarm basically transparently handles uh, distributing your containers to the different system. And the great thing about Swarm is that it has uh, almost the same API as the Docker core engine. So you can, for example, use it from Python exactly like you would use Docker on a single machine. And uh, as I said, like the containers are completely isolated from each other, so each container runs in its own process. And hence, if you have a multi-core machine, you can, of course, make use of all the cores, and the operating system will um, take care of, um, schedule of uh, allocating resources to each of these containers. In that sense, a container is nothing, um, not much different from a process running on the operating system. Is that answering your question? OK. Maybe that it would be uh, too much overhead, uh, but did you consider uh, dockerizing Apache Spark for this map reduce thing? Like uh, just putting uh, Apache, uh, Spark workers in uh, Docker containers? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, in general, Docker provides a great way to um, um, build a local um, setup where you can test out technologies like MapReduce and Spark uh, in an environment on your own machine. So I think it's definitely possible to have a setup, uh, uh, for example, running Spark, um, if that's your question. And um, on the other way around, it's also, of course, possible to use, for example, Docker containers from inside, uh, um, inside the Spark ecosystem or inside Hadoop. So I know that Hadoop, for example, has a runner that can make use of Docker containers to perform the, uh, the map steps. So both of these technologies can, can be kind of used in conjunction with each other. Is that? Yeah, yeah, but uh, I uh -huh. think your main uh, purpose is to make it uh, as small as possible, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. self-contained, 
so I thought uh, maybe Hadoop is a very big thing. Uh, Apache, Smart, Apache Smart is uh, more uh, like a lightweight, or lightweight mm -hmm. Hadoop for uh, MapReduce. So I just thought uh, that may uh, solve your problems with uh, distributing work, serializing results, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I didn't look into this, uh, but uh, it's possible that it's a good fit. Yeah. Any more questions? There? You talked uh, uh, a lot about dependencies, mm -hmm. but I, I think uh, uh, there are two kinds of dependencies and uh, we should not make confusion. At least we should focus on the on possible and evident dif differences. One is uh, code dependencies, dependencies between uh, software packages, versions, mm -hmm. and so on. And the other is data dependencies, like models that are built on data, that is built on other data, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, maybe it's kind of a theoretical question, but uh, how do you do you see these two different concepts of different dependencies interacting? Uh, are is there going to be like a, a, a single tool uh, instru uh, or instrument that can solve both, or uh, we, or we are going to build completely different tools yeah. to solve them. I think that was um, the, the question. Yeah, as, a, as I said, I think images are a great way of solving the uh, dependency problem um, with software. So we can uh, use images to make a, a reproducible um, um, environment for um, analyzing the data that we have, where we are sure that all the dependencies and all the uh, software um, code, for example, is at a given state. and. Uh, for, making, for managing the dependency of the data, um, we need a different tool um, because Docker is, in my opinion, not the right choice for doing that. And uh, for example, Pachyderm and uh, other um, technologies uh, have some support for these kind of uh, things where you have like large data sets that you want to version control and uh, that you want to um, manage in that sense. Um, and personally, I think that code can also be treated as data in that sense. If you would look at the different inputs of your container. As I showed them before, you could um, also take the software and like the scripts that are um, used for analyzing um, the other data as uh, data themselves. So in that sense, you can uh, treat those two things under the same paradigm, I think. It's, of course, always a question, um, what is the best practical way of then handling these things? Because the scale is very different, because code is usually quite small and manageable, uh, whereas data can be very large and uh, um, cannot be managed effectively using, for example, source code version control systems. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Any other questions? No? Okay, so thanks again.